Um, so I wanted to do a quick talk about uh, JW Player, a uh, company I founded now 12 years ago. Um, we, um, you know, we build software tools. Uh, we also uh, provide uh, data insights uh, to a growing number of our customers. And, and we essentially help them you know, grow their revenues. What kind of customers are they? They're typically you know, people in the, uh, or companies in the, in the media and entertainment space. So you see some examples here are the, you know, like, uh, Vice, Viacom, BBC, National Geographic, Sky. Uh, we also work with, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, with companies like the NMS, uh, New.nl, and um, oh, very important, uh, PSV here in, uh, in Eindhoven, uh, delivering uh, you know, through video the good news and the bad news, uh, as you can see. Um, so yeah, we're, uh, we're providing, uh, so this is our main product also, we're providing video player and video platform technologies for them. So uh, you know, they don't have to put their videos on YouTube and Facebook, lose, ha lose out on their revenue and their audiences, and uh, really you know, stay in control of their, uh, of their users and their experiences. Uh, we're a um, pretty uh, you know, sizable operation. Uh, so we have roughly half a million of those uh, customers using JW Player, and we touch roughly one in six people in the world. Uh, so uh, over a billion people across the globe uh, are essentially watching video in JW Player. You all have watched video in JW Player this week, uh, if not this month. Um, but you know, given the fact that we're inside uh, the websites of a lot of these uh, customers, uh, you probably don't know that. Uh, in total, uh, last year we streamed uh, 160 billion videos. That's um, you know, orders of magnitude more than the Netherlands uh, is doing. Uh, ingested uh, roughly 10 million videos, so people are uploading uh, a, you know, a, couple mil a couple videos a second into our system. And uh, we deliver 40 billion ad impressions. That's, of course, how a lot of these companies get paid. Uh, so we're delivering a couple millions or, or sustaining because we're not uh, you know, in the advertisement chain, but we're sustaining that revenue for them. So you know, how did we get started there? Um, well, that's really fast. Yeah, here we go. Um, it started in um, uh, actually while I was uh, still in Design Academy and uh, I built, uh, you know, working with video. Uh, we had a lot of uh, video projects also at uh, the, the software company that I worked part time for as a web designer. And uh, back in the days, you had Real, Real Player and Windows m Video Player. And then if you wanted to put a video on your website, it was a link you clicked on it. You had to install Real Player. It came with toolbars and advertisements, etc. cetera. And um, so what I did was essentially develop a very small video player that you could put on your website. Click play, and then the video would play on your website. Um, so did that from my, uh, what, you know, while I was still at the Design Academy. And um, one of the first uh, your sites using us was this little obscure uh, company called YouTube. Uh, so they used uh, JW Player in the first uh, you know, year, two years of their existence. Uh, nobody heard of YouTube back then. Uh, only uh, you know, two years later, it uh, started to pop up. Um, I also started to make money with it. Uh, so I, I started charging um, 15 euros for a license in case uh, the, the, you know, there was a company using the video player. So I extracted 15 euros of uh, revenue out of YouTube, uh, which, uh, you know, in hindsight, might have been uh, you know, not the best uh, business model. But of course, there's a lot of other companies out there like YouTube that uh, was, I was also able to sell um, uh, these licenses to. And then um, later on, um, more and more people started to ask questions around, hey, uh, the video quality is not good enough, or hey, I want to make money with advertisements, those kind of things that you could not you know, solve with a piece of software. So then I um, actually started to um, think about, oh, can we build a business out of this? And there I found two American partners. So I, so I shopped around, really wanted to find uh, people in the, in the United States because that um, still is, uh, but, but of course, way back definitely was the, the biggest market in terms of video and, uh, and digital advertising. 
and um, found my two co-founders, uh, found two partners, and then we started uh, the company, got a little bit of investment funding, uh, first one million, later half a million, a year, a year later or so. And then in addition to the video player, we also started building uh, a, a portal, like uh, services for encoding your video and streaming your video. So very similar to what a YouTube is doing for publishers uh, or for like uh, you know, individual creators, you have a couple of videos you want to put YouTube on there. We have a similar model uh, for publishers and of course, you know, trying to make it as easy as possible for people to, um, uh, to use, uh, use these services. So for example, uh, from a company like New.nl, at any point in time, there will be 100 or so editors uploading videos in that system. And um, you know, of course, it needs to be as easy as a, as a YouTube for them. Then um, we were still purely uh, software engineers and uh, product managers. So at a certain point in 2013, uh, we made, a, and then video was still you know, growing rapidly as a company. We were profitable, but um, we, we thought that we could grow this out much, much more. So at a certain point, we decided to actually go to you know, one of these big companies, a VC firm, and uh, try to raise uh, real venture money. So we raised a round of uh, $5 million and you know, used, did, did a couple of things with that. One of them was um, you really build out a sales and marketing organization. Up until then, it was you know, the left side of what you, this is our, our website, our pricing page. The left side of the pricing page was essentially all we got, uh, a small package, a middle package. And then we had a big call us button if you were big. And then uh, you know, our sales team kicked into motion. And you know, instead of selling $5 or $50 uh, packages, we sell $50,000 packages. Uh, so that, uh, that really uh, paid for itself uh, and, and then some in, uh, in terms of uh, you know, ROI. Another thing that we did, which was, was pretty cool, is uh, we were here with six, seven engineers. We actually moved to New York for a couple of years as we started building out the business. So the engineers uh, uh, from Eindhoven uh, you know, got to work in, um, in, uh, in our Manhattan office, uh, uh, moved to Brooklyn, moved to Manhattan, moved to Queens in certain areas. And there, uh, you know, some of them are still there and uh, we're still building, uh, you know, still working on the same products uh, and uh, you know, enjoying life as a, as a New Yorker. Uh, then, um, of course, now in the, in the last couple of years, um, there's been uh, a, an, a, a shift in terms of emphasis. Uh, we used to work only on video delivery. Uh, so actually, you know, sending the video out in, so in the video players, so which it loads fast and the quality is high. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're now in the era of uh, you know, 4K, 60 frames per second video. So, you know, there's not much higher and better and faster than you can get. Uh, so what we are really focusing on or, or um, you know, adding to our stack is now much more tools around um, insights that we can get from our, uh, from our network. Uh, because there are so many uh, companies use J using JW Player, so many videos that we have in our system that we can help, you know, build, help, help that to build insights for our customers. And uh, we call that video uh, intelligence. Uh, can show you a quick, uh, you know, teaser video. Lush's Lord of Misrule originally started as a bath bomb with a wine-colored center to throw back to these intoxicated parties. These bath bombs were such a hit that Lush decided to make a product that you could use in your shower too. I'm Helen Levy. I'm a potter in Brooklyn, New York. Welcome to my studio. Fortunately, there's plenty of fatty suckers. That boozy cranberry sauce.
So, um, yeah, interesting sizzle reel. Uh, what exactly does this mean? Uh, really, what we're what we're what we're working on here in um, uh, in New York and also here in Eindhoven, where we started uh, an, an office as we also you know scaled out our sales in Europe, is um, you're trying to understand. You know, what video is about, what's inside the videos that people are looking at, and then uh, you get, give our customers analytics on those videos and understanding you know, which formats work, which formats do not work, what, what do audiences engage with and what do they not engage with. Um, you know, there's, there's billions of dollars being spent on, uh, on the one hand, you know, researches into, and surveys and, and test screenings, those kind of things, and on the other hand also, in, in, you know, producing video that uh, nobody watches or everybody drops out after 10 seconds. And there's, there's, there's really two components to that. And then the first component is uh, on the video side. Uh, video used to be a black box where uh, you, know, you have a title, there's a description, and then there's a lot of stuff inside the a video that we as a human can understand. But in terms of um, you know, making that um, understandable through, for analytic systems or uh, your advertising systems, those kind of, you know, machine uh, systems was really hard. And now uh, with, um, you know, with techniques like, like deep learning, we're, we're very, very much able to, you know, jump inside a video and automatically understand from the text on the screen uh, or the spoken audio in the video, what's, what's going on in here? What is this video about? What are people saying? Uh, what's the scores at you know, two minutes, three minutes, four minutes? Um, we can look at um, you know, visual labels. Uh, we can attach labels, say like, oh, who is this player? What are the teams that, that are playing here? Because we see the logos. What kind of setting is it? It's a soccer match, it's a soccer stadium. Um, what kind of, you know, is this a wide field um, uh, camera or wide angle camera or a close up camera? Um, then we can take a look at, uh, for example, where are the highlights in the, in the video? Uh, with uh, you know, millions and millions of hours of video being uploaded into systems every day, you know, nobody has time to watch all that. So, how, you know, how easy or how great would it be if you can squeeze that uh, your two hour game or you know, five minute uh, user generated clip that you upload into a fraction of that time so you can but you can still see the highlights so uh, you know people can still find the, the, the message or the uh, you know the core of the message in that video and then uh, you know of course it's it's important to figure out okay where does one story end and the other story start so you can uh, you can start to highlight like hey this part is about um, you know this, the, the the game itself that part afterwards is about celebrities uh, or the celebrations after the game so uh, you can do things like chop this video up offer them as separate clips uh, on on a website or in a mobile um, uh, mobile feed or in a social feed and also uh, do things like target specifically towards them. And then, you know, as you have all these insights from videos, uh, then um, we can, you know, start measuring. Huh? Um, there's people watch videos, all the analytics are coming back into our system. And then we can do things like score how the video is doing uh, compared to similar videos that we have in our system. Uh, we have you know, good, uh, you know, we have such large amounts of, of video in our system that we can find pools of videos that are similar and then understand you know, why, are, why is one performing better than the other and um, you know, how, can, um, you know, how can a customer make adjustments to make sure that their videos are not at the bottom but at the top of that, uh, you know, of that pile of, for example, soccer summary videos. Um, we can take a look at highlighting uh, versus averages again, where in the video there's maybe a, a, a super interesting uh, component. Uh, a lot of people are watching, even replaying. Uh, we do this for um, uh, very high quality websites like uh, uh, Dumpert. Uh, I don't know if the, the uh, English uh, 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 people in the audience know that, but it's like, uh, you know, the 
you know, the goofy, the funny jokes, the little, you know, typically they're two minute videos. Um, and then we always get engagement charts from these videos that have a spike. And that's, you know, that's where the stupid thing happens. So uh, what we were able to do automatically for those kind of sites is clip that out as a 10 second clip. And then they can put that on a Facebook or an Instagram or turn this into an animated GIF. So you can push it even in uh, you know, more uh, locations. Um, we can also do testing. So we have two versions of a video or five versions of a video. And then you see which one is, is doing the best in terms of either performance uh, or engagement. People are watching the most of the video or uh, in terms of advertising revenue. Where am I getting most money for that video? That's, of course, uh, uh, also very important to a lot of these uh, media companies. And then last, uh, since we have the, this categorization, uh, that I this labeling that I showed in the previous slide on videos, we can also take a look across the network, what's trending. So maybe uh, you know, this, um, the match uh, PSV Barcelona is a trending uh, topic. Uh, we can highlight that to a publisher that might not have uh, published a video about it yet. Uh, so they can understand like, hey, my users are now watching content about uh, the PSV Barcelona. Uh, on another website, wait a second, I should have some content on my site about that as well. So, you know, I don't lose those people. They are come to my site to watch that content. Or conversely, uh, if you have stale topics, uh, those will also be uh, highlighted in your, uh, in your library. So that way, um, you're essentially super high level. What we can do is, is help these publishers through these insights into videos, into their user consumption. Um, and like kind of get the same insights as um, um, uh, provide the same insights to their editors or their advertisers as they would get on um, from the big platforms from a Facebook or a YouTube or an Instagram and and that way as a media company it's 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 less hard to uh, to uh, you know fight for your share of that uh, that uh, end user attention and um, um, you, you know, be able to do the same uh, to make the same decisions as uh, for example the Facebook uh, editorial and uh, and uh, product teams are making um, so. And then just looking forward, uh, we're, we're, we're rolling out these products. Um, how do we feel about business overall? Um, I think uh, your video is a great place to be in, digital video. Um, the majority of internet traffic is already video. A big chunk of uh, time spent on internet is already video. That keeps growing. Uh, money uh, going into videos also continues to grow. Um, we are looking at those kind of numbers to figure out, okay, what should we do next? Uh, for example, the money on the, on the um, uh, advertising side, there are uh, countries in Asia that are growing relatively or rapidly, like very fast, uh, in India and in Indonesia. So one of our focuses for the coming year is uh, how can we um, open office? in Asia, not necessarily jump to uh, Japan, which has a relatively um, stale uh, growth in terms of uh, you know, video viewing and audiences, uh, but, but try to be relatively early in a country like in India uh, or Indonesia and uh, you know, pick up customers as they're small and then grow along with them. And that's been um, you know, very successful in South America. It's been very, very successful in Europe. Uh, where we now have a, a lot of the you know, more digital customers, and uh, you know, we hopefully that that you know, can replicate itself in APAC. So things like market sizes, you know, any kind of product, what whatever you're building, it's it's very important to keep in mind you know, what the total uh, cap is on the the, the company size that uh, that you might have, or the the amount of revenue that you can make. Um, yeah, last one. Um, you know, there's, of course, uh, th this was a funny stat from a couple of weeks ago at the NOS website um, that um, they, every, every week they show their, uh, their top TV shows, Boer uh, Frau and uh, those kind of uh, shows. And then they have the average age they displayed. And it was pretty shocking that the average age of, uh, of uh, you know, essentially the, the you know, person watching TV in the Netherlands is 54 years old. Uh, so as you look at 
cumulatively how people, what the, what the split is between I'm watching video on the internet or I'm watching video on like you know, old TV, you know, broadcast TV. Um, there's a small decline, but if you jump into age cohorts, actually what you're seeing is that everybody who is above uh, you know, a certain age still watches TV, and then after that it just goes downhill. And, and you know, people that are now in the, I think it's called, um, you know, not the millennials, but the, you know, the, the Gen Z range, they don't, wa they don't watch TV. They never had TV, they don't know what to do with it. And as that, that like, the uh, steep drop, in that uh, in that uh, chart, just slides. Um, you know the the problems for for linear broadcasters start to get bigger and bigger. Um, the opportunities for for digital uh, companies, uh, our customers, uh, start to get uh, bigger and bigger as well. So I think that that's a very interesting underlying trend that uh, you know we're we're very happy to uh, to be riding the the wave on. And that's it. So had a quick background and then the, 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 our focus on intelligence and then just a quick uh, look into where we're going in the future. Thank you. <laughs> Is there time for questions? Yep. Hi. Very good product. Uh, um, but you're a designer. You graduated at the Design Academy. Yeah. Do you still design? Um, I still design uh, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, I also still um, code a little bit. I you know, must admit that most of my work these days is uh, spreadsheets and presentations, and uh, your dashboard, uh, looking at uh, business dashboards. But yeah, I still, uh, I still do uh, do some design. I think that that's also one of the strengths that we have. Uh, a lot of our competitor products are very engineering driven, and then you know you open up their system. End users are, um, or you know, the editors, they want something that looks like Vimeo or this looks like YouTube, and then they get something that looks like Windows 95, and uh, you know that's uh, that's definitely an advantage to us that uh, we're still pushing. So we have a, our design is pretty high up in our hierarchy. So yeah, very good to hear. Thank you. Um, what you showed is all uh, already produced uh, video content. Uh, since streaming can also mean like this is uh, that's live streaming. Uh, are you also going to develop software or technology to um, analyze a live stream video and then on the fly uh, do all these calculations because that takes a lot of real time processing in comparison to feeding something, having uh, the computer uh, think about it, and then yeah. putting something out again. Yeah, yeah. So on the delivery side, uh, the, the video player and the, the streaming, we indeed have a component of live, much used for, for events like, these, like this, and, and used a lot for sports. And we're indeed looking at uh, uh, processing um, the video in live. Um, the uh, the you know the resources that you need are are, are not that massive because we, what one of the things we're also doing is um, making sure that the video is available in different versions you know different qualities so if you're on a mobile phone and you have a bad connection the video doesn't stutter uh, and that that is actually something we do today and that requires more resources and so from a resource perspective it's not that uh, difficult uh, what's mostly difficult is that you don't have that much context. Uh, so if you want to look at, uh, for example, um, you know, describe a scene, is this, uh, you know, is this a soccer stadium, is this an outdoor, is it at the beach, uh, you only have that one image or that one sh chunk to work with instead of a, a string of, uh, of images. You, can, you, know, you can't look forward. So that's, uh, you know, that's a little bit, and then if you want to look forward, you kind of have to lag a little bit, but then your user is lagging the real-time feed. So those are, those are some of the, of the uh, problems that come along with it. Uh, but yeah, they're not that uh, that big. So I think we'll we'll be having you know, products in the real time uh, in the live uh, 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 range soon too. Thank you. I actually have two questions. You, uh, if I may, um, you uh, showed us this chart about video scoring, and I was wondering the scoring. Uh, I, I assume there's a certain mechanism behind it. Um, I call it valuation. What scores higher than something else? 
Mm -hmm. Is that something that you do or do your customers decide on the scoring? Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. What we're essentially doing is, is benchmarking um, uh, either uh, absolute. So, for example, uh, one of our scores is um, how good is your preview? How, is, how good is your poster? Uh, you know, you get a, always get a preview, poster image and a title. You click on it and the video starts. So, after 100 people that uh, see the poster image, how many people click? So, that's a very um, you know, objective or, or very um, you know, bounded score that we can give. The other ones are more relative to the other videos that you have. So given certain, um, you know, for example, uh, PSV, uh, they have a lot of uh, summaries, a lot of uh, five minute uh, uh, game summaries. So there we can look at how does the, the video, you know, how does the, how do the users drop off in this uh, video compared to the hundreds of other videos that they have or other customers like uh, PSV might have, like uh, Bundesliga in Germany is another customer of ours. So that way uh, you, can, uh, you can have relative scores and then it's more of a cohort score. So we provide that as well. Thank you. And my second question is um, also projecting maybe to the future is does all this video processing that you do, does it have or may it have any predictive values in the sense like, okay, this is what the video is and what will likely to be happening next? Is that already um, so possible or is it, <laughs> do you think it will be possible? So at large, there are definitely, uh, so we, we see all these analytics. We train, uh, for, for example, a good example is uh, the, those poster images that I talked about. Uh, we see all these analytics on what poster images click a lot, people click on and people don't click on. Um, then we train a uh, you know deep model on um, from the video find which thumbnails are most like the poster images that people click on and the least like poster images people don't click on and that way you you can predict that these are probably the the best uh, you know, poster images to sh the best frames to pick from a video to show uh, so to get people excited about the video and click play um, there's uh, I, do, I, you know, I don't think that a fully automated uh, solution is, um, is uh, the best way to go or necessarily. Um, you know, you're talking about creativity and there's, uh, there's a lot of things that a machine, you know, a machine can only repeat uh, so it cannot do something new and um, your know, editors, m editors themselves are probably able to make, like design better thumbnails if they do that offline than, uh, you know, pick, have a machine pick one from a video. So I think it's more about saving time uh, than, um, you know, replacing, uh, replacing work. Okay, thank you. Okay, good evening and welcome at our presentation. First of all, we would like to thank uh, Innovation Cafe for giving, giving us the platform to talk about our Stichting, our foundation Stichting Stemic. Um, Today we will shortly introduce to you uh, what the foundation is about, what we do, and uh, uh, how we are going to take it further in the future. Okay. My name is Anita, and he is uh, Yvonne. We both are in mechatronics uh, students at the Fontes Engineer. University of Applied Science in Eindhoven. At first, we will talk about the organization who organized the competition where we take part. And after that, we will uh, talk about our robotics competition team. And we will introduce our foundation. And after that, a little bit about our partners who help us uh, doing this project. And now Yvonne will shortly introduce the organization who organized the competition. Do you? Yes, thank you. Uh, so the organization is called FIRST and it stands for For Inspiration and Recognition of Science and Technology. So it's a mouthful. Uh, and the one that founded it is the guy there 
on the right, on the left, uh, Dean Kamen, and he came with the idea to introduce more technology into lower uh, education systems, so kids like from up the age of eight uh, can also already learn something about technology, because what we see here in the Netherlands is that a lot of schools, like elementary schools or high schools, do nothing with technology and kids only get like theoretical uh, uh, subjects and courses. So he started the idea of first in the way of doing four different, four different uh, levels of uh, robotics competitions, where it starts from the age of eight, eight I think, eight to, eight to 12, 12 to 14 with the first Lego League, and then 14, only 12 to 18 for the first Tech Challenge, and 14 to 18 for the first Robotics Challenge. Um, and also, first, they want to invite uh, invite uh, kids from these ages into STEM education. So you see uh, on the right, uh, it also helps. So they uh, try to measure it with the impact they have on these uh, youth, on these students. Uh, and they see there are a lot of uh, kids that do these programs also go and study uh, engineering subjects or software subjects or science, uh, math. So they see kids that do these programs also go and do STEM-related education programs. Uh, and we with Robotics Team Pi that we first started are competing in the highest level, the first robotics competition. So it all started in 2016 when we were second years uh, in a Megatronics uh, uh, study uh, and we wanted to uh, do like a project and it started with a robotics team uh, and it called and we called it Robotics Team Pi. We did like a year where we built a robot uh, but we did not compete in any competition or in a game. We just figured out how do you start a team, what do you need, uh, like what goals do you want to achieve when you build this team, uh, etc. Till like 2017, where we were uh, third years, and we wanted to continue with this team and to uh, expand it also within high school. So from that year, we started a collaboration with the high school in Best, uh, and you can see here in the middle. Uh, these are some high schoolers we are working with and we give them lessons in 3D drawings uh, like SolidWorks. Um, we let them uh, do some software like C++ if, uh, if you know it. And also some practical skills like uh, soldering, uh, like little components on, on boards. And like what we do, we want to teach them not only knowledge uh, theoretical but also practical. So we teach them, we learn them, and we practically use that, uh, yeah, on a real robot. Uh, and Anita is going to tell you some more about like this robot and what the competition is about, uh, where the where these students made a robot for. First of all, um, when uh, we say that we compete in a robotics competition, then mostly people think we do take part on a football robot competition or battle bots. It's not both of them. Uh, it's a different kind of uh, competition. Every year in January you get uh, the game reveal and also game manual where all the project descriptions are, what the requirements are, what the limitations are and uh, they are really strict with the rules. So uh, you have to take care of uh, like your robots don't need to be um, extend the maximum weight. It doesn't have to. Uh, it doesn't need to. It doesn't can. It can contain uh, sharp aces and that kind of things. Um, last year, the competition was about uh, those yellow box you need to put in a space, uh, and you had the higher level 
you also could uh, choose to put it in a higher switch. Yeah, and at the end, you also could uh, choose to climb. Since we are a beginning team, we chose only to do the lower switch, what you saw at the beginning, because we wanted to play the competition where we could do one thing really good instead of just trying everything and at the end we are, are not able to com accomplish one of uh, the thing and so you can see the pro uh, the field the basically at the competition there there is 15 seconds of autonomous period where the robots needs to do things on automatically and after 15 seconds the human operators drive the robot and the human operators needs to be under 18 years so at the competition our high school kids drive the robot so they play it A bit. Oh. Yeah. Um, we don't only work with high school kids, but we also have collaboration with different engineering studies as well, uh, like mechatronics, electrotechnic, and uh, mechanical engineering, because the purpose of that is when you later on go to work at the company, you need to collaborate with different uh, engineer engineers instead of only engineers of your faculty. And here you can see sort of view of America. This is uh, the robot that we built. Here you can see the competition field. And uh, yeah, as you can see, we are doing the competition in America. So it's an international robotics competition where all kinds of countries are going to, like you have teams in China, you have them in Germany, Israel, Australia, Chile, Peru. Like a lot of countries are competing also in these games. Uh, so, and most of the games are in America because the organization is uh, settled and founded in America. Um, so we go there also with the high school kids. Uh, as you can see, there are a lot of pictures from uh, from the games there, but it's not all about doing the games, but we also want, because we do not probably come there much, check some of the cultural uh, elements that are in the, in the area. So we also have been to, like, the picture is now turned, but <laughs> it's, a, it's a tower and it's in the Grand Canyon, so we also been there and watch to the Grand Canyon with all the kids and it was really fun to also see like these uh, like things because you can't see them here in the Netherlands and yeah also the pictures are a little pixelated but yeah. when you are there like the vibe is uh, like uh, very hyped also so you, you're standing there uh, uh, with the game so you're in the in the back here and you stand there with two uh, drivers and one coach and you have like as Anita say, uh, said uh, first 15 seconds are autonomously then uh, drivers are picking up uh, joysticks and also are controlling the robot um, and you want to yeah, score as much points as you can get so when you uh, also she said like the climbing you can climb you can get a lot of points with that there was this team um, and they could lift other robots so that was like really cool and when you are doing that it's a little stress because you need to do everything fast and uh, we drove on this robot and it lifted and just everybody began and jumping and screaming and yelling so you see the guy he couldn't believe that it was happening uh, and we got so many points and with those points we actually also won uh, like that specifically game so it's really nice to also see like the young students cheering so much and being so happy when they do this and also being so proud of making like this robot and competing in this uh, competition and yeah.
like the picture also a little pixelated you can't really yeah. see it but uh, anita is holding uh, an award there because we also uh yeah won a, won a uh, award there like the rookie all-star award which uh tells that our robot is good enough to play in the world championship games uh, and we have a good outreach in the netherlands by going to schools uh, giving lectures to uh, high schoolers and also um, yeah uh, how do you say having a good contact also with our sponsors and uh, having good communication between us uh, so we were very proud that a team like so young already like won this amazing award and granted us also a place in the world championship uh, of last year yeah that was our first year which gave us motivation to go further and uh, here you can only see the pictures and people and the things but when you go to america you can see all the surroundings how people react and stuff um there are really young kids who can uh, who are really motivated for technique and uh, that kind of studies it gave when we were there the impact what that has on the children gave us the motivation and the inspiration to go further and take it bring it to the netherlands because in the netherlands we don't have like even said we don't have the systems when i was at havo studying i only had the practical st uh, stuff no i only had the theoretical stuff we had books we needed to do and i was really interested in technique but i didn't get at school anything so our um, idea is to get the knowledge to the children so they can choose for in, uh, engineering studies or other studies but they will have the brief yeah knowledge they need to start at the uh, university that's why we started at a foundation called stamic Oh, yeah. oh, <laughs> um, we did this we go to the high school and we invite high school at uh, our f school at Fontes and give them a, a introduction to our project what they can expect and things but also uh, all, but we also go to the implements like FTC what is the lower level of uh, first competition and there are the children who are participating on FTC they can drive our robot and see what is FRC, what our FTC robot looks like so they can an experience already and then in the future they probably might get into FTC and uh, here in Eindhoven and in Brabant is Dots Technology Week uh, really famous so every year we stand there at our stand and there are lots of young children and also elder people come to our stand and drive the robot by themselves and it's quite interesting to see that further huh? yeah like this year we uh are also starting a, a, a level uh, lower as the FRC we are already in with uh, new high schoolers on uh, on this school on this high school we are have, we have a col collaboration with uh, and that's like the first tech challenge so 16 uh, like children students from uh, from the high school also doing the first tech challenge uh, and what it's special about the first tech challenge is that um, like the FRC is a very big and complex robot already so don't be fooled like with the pictures we showed earlier which like the animations looked uh, like kind of uh, like child uh, childish um, but the robot that, that needs to be made is very complex and the uh, uh, stuff that's in the robot are very expensive uh, and the programs we use are also in the software very uh, hard to learn especially by children that do not study technology or something uh, uh, 
as we do uh, as uh, university students. But in the first tech challenge, uh, they are doing it by themselves and they have a lot of uh, time to learn about it. Because FRC, you do it in six weeks. You build this robot that's here in the corner in six weeks and that's like pretty much no time because you need to uh, design it from scratch and then you need to have your sponsors or your uh, uh, companies that are going to uh, build some uh, products for your uh, robot uh, be informed that they need to make them as, f as fast as possible because you, you only have six weeks uh, you need to test this uh, you need to drive with it so the kids get a feeling of how the robot is driving. So it, that six weeks is pretty like short period. And we also have the exam week in, the, yeah, in yeah, between the six week weeks, so it will be around five weeks, four and a half weeks. So and the first yeah, it's quite hard. Yeah. And the first tech challenge in that way is uh, already started. The video and the uh, assignment is already online. So they have lots of more time to think about what are we wanting to make. So that is also only with high school students and we teach them like how do you uh, uh, do a brainstorm, how do you uh, put in as much as ideas as possible to come to, a, to one concept that you are ready to build. And they have like, what is it, three or four months, maybe more to oh, yeah. actually build and think of this robot. So we, yeah, they have just lots and lots of more time to do it. So we only and do that with high schoolers. They need to finish the robots uh, around the same time as we do, but their uh, game reveal has al uh, yeah, yeah. already happened last week. So they have now, from now on, the time to build a robot while our game reveal is on the first week of first weekend of January and after six week it needs to be to America and a fun fact is the left picture is like the first robot that uh, we as founders of uh, robotics team Pi actually built in our first year and you can see that one is uh, less complex already as this one but, uh, uh, and this is the second robot we yeah we've built it and that's also been to the United States uh, and actually did the competition and also did the world championship. So uh, this is like the proud robot uh, called Blinky. If some people know it from like the, the red uh, ghost from Pac-Man, because Pac-Man uh, is yellow and Blinky is eating yellow stuff. And, he's and also Blinky uh, is eating Pac-Man. So that's like a fun fact from our robot from, uh, from last year. 5 October in Wolfsburg in Utrecht. If you want to drive the robot, talk with other students, um, get more information, then you are welcome to. Yeah, you are welcome to come our, at our stand in those uh, events. But further than that, and that, we also organize our own events where parents, sponsors, other teachers, and students can come and see what we are doing and how are at the end how our robot looks like and we also give the presentations for uh, lower classes of uh, uh, high school uh, so they can uh, at, in the future they can join team Pi as well and in the future we want to try to expand it to um, Lower school, bus school, I don't know what's called. Elementary go. school. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, like you saw, there are four different competitions. So we want to try those first two competitions at uh, uh, the lower school. And that's our main goal in the future and have our own kind of competition in the Netherlands. Companies and other uh, uh, students, they do the project together so they can learn about where they can work later on if they are interested in those fields instead of uh, doing just a theoretical project and uh, writing a report and handing in and uh, getting your grades. So we had a teacher who can at uh, Herbeck, uh, he, she contacted us and then asked if we were interested to, to have the children at our project. And we were searching for the children and, and so we get them. 
Yeah, it's like a company day at the school. So they invite all these different uh, companies that have projects with the school. Uh, and they have like a stand there and you can show the kids like uh, our project is about building a robot or is about uh, organizing an event. So the children come into like that room, they search for uh, the stand because they already know which stands there are. So they search for the stand they are interested in. They are going to talk with us like what is the project about, they have some questions about it. Uh, and then they can choose like I want to sign in for this uh, project. And if there are more than 10, then they will do some gambling about yeah, who's doing which project. Uh, and so, uh, so that's like the way we get um, like the high schoolers into the team. Like the school chooses which kids are going to do which projects at like uh, Fontes. Yeah, priority uh, for which one is their first choice and their second choice. So that's uh, yeah, how they choose like the project. And like gender specific, we do not have, we do not, uh, if they're all women, we do, it doesn't matter for us. Uh, but what you see is like mostly there are a lot of yeah, guys that are doing such projects. Uh, not a lot of women uh, are choosing robotics or megatronics or, or even engineering. Yeah, there are not that much women no. interested in uh, technical studies, but we are trying to find them yeah. and uh, make them interested in tech, uh, technique by doing this kind of project so they can there is no like only guys can join this project because it's technical but also girls can join it and they can see if technique is something for them so no but there are really few girls who are interested that's uh... yeah we have this this girl and uh, she wanted to to join the team and she was really happy and she kept like jumping from I, I really want to join I really want to join so uh, if we see like uh, students are that motivated to join we also go in uh, in uh, talk with like the, the teachers and say like she's that motivated we really want to like take her in the team and show her what engineering is about and yeah, hopefully she can uh, like live up to her dreams and do engineering if that is what she wants but what also happens sometimes is the girls have a group of girls together and uh, there is one girl interested in technical studies but the others are not and then she will go with the group and not choose the technical project or technical studies which is yeah that's that is what i see mostly on those uh, events or on the high school as well because one girl will come to our stand and ask a few questions but other girls will join and say like and uh, technique and after that she also moves and then it's like choose for yourself not for your group or her. yeah so that's like a big big issue also in engineering and they do a lots of events uh, for women only to let them come to engineering because they say they see a lot of guys will choose it but we see in our study in Megatronics, there are yeah. a lot of girls joining in. Uh, uh, We're still not I, that much. Not not that much, but I know the, fr the, the time we started, Anita was with two other girls. Like la the year later, there were five, and then there were eight, and now there are 12 or something. So we see it grows, but not that much. Any Do you go out uh, as a specific question? Yeah, I do kind of presentations. I also at the Fontes they have uh, a day where they invite high school kids from not only Herbic College where we have the collaboration with, but they also invite other high school uh, students to Fontes and I, ga I gave their few presentations last year but still at that time I also see girls are sitting at the back and they are not that much interested and the guys are interested and they will uh, ask if they can drive the robots and they will play with the robots while girls are sitting behind and uh, no, no 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 and I always try to make them drive and I say like come and drive it's not that hard or it won't scare you and at the end they do but 
No. But I <laughs> Yeah, what you see is guys, they're simple and they see something move, they want to yeah. also make it move. So Yeah, they are more in interested in uh, do, uh, driving the robot than they are interested in the presentation, but goals are not that much. Yeah. And then one other question for both of you is, uh, this is all uh, uh, the neighborhood of Bangalore. Uh, I come from Bangalore, which is not that far away, but how, is, uh, how does this translate, uh, bring this knowledge out to schools that are farther away from um. the yeah, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, we have some talkings with a school in Shidan, like in the neighborhood of Rotterdam. So we're trying to expand some, some further. Uh, and also we try to do it with like the companies that are sponsoring, like SMC is a, is a uh, company that's in Amsterdam. Uh, Elo Bau and four people are in uh, Sertogenbos. So we try to also with sponsoring go further in, uh, yeah, in the Netherlands, more upwards and try and also uh, yeah, let these companies help us also to choose some schools there and to have some education, more technical education there. We're also like in the future want to make, uh, like as Anita said, uh, a own game that we can do in the Netherlands that's more uh, in our schedule, like in summer or what she said. Um, and then we want to like make some papers for that and go to a lot of schools uh, throughout uh, the whole Netherlands. So that's more for the future. Now we're trying to like yeah. yeah. list our at staff at Eindhoven have a good structure, have a good team, yeah. and so we can give the knowledge to other school as well. So Start we are small are we are go yeah we are trying to make the blueprints for the setting of so uh, such teams. So yeah, in the future we will do it, but not. Uh, now it's too big to uh, <laughs> yeah go and go for it. Yes. More questions? Yeah. Well, thank you for your attention and. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, guys, just to let. Oh wait, I don't need this. Um,